Um, good morning to all. Um, I am in awe of our first speaker, and I do not know how I'm going to be able to follow that one. <laughs> um, I, I am not an academic. Uh, I am a technologist. Um, I can't talk about things as grand as uh, the Big Bang and black holes, but I can tell you something about technology and what we're able to do. Um, today I want to talk about exponential technology, which is sort of an odd topic, but I think it describes some of the change that we're feeling in the world today. We know something's shifting. We know something great is happening, but we can't quite put our finger on it. I want to try and give you some insight into that. Um, we'll start off by talking about what exponential thinking is, why, why I think something's happening. We'll talk about machine learning and why it's having such a powerful impact on our world. And lastly, how does that change how we see opportunities going forward? If the jobs we knew of, if the products we knew of growing up no longer exist, where do we find opportunity for ourselves? There was a time. There was a time when all weather was local. Information was local. Everything I wanted to know, I had to get myself. In the time before the smartphone, before the Weather Channel, before Facebook, before the telephone, if I wanted to know the weather for my crops, for my farm, for my family, I had only one option. Well, I had two. I could look outside, or I could trust my gut. It felt like rain today. That was my only option. The, the information I got, I was fairly closed in. See, the problem is understanding what the weather was a day's horse ride away. Well, it took a horse ride for a day to get there. I couldn't know that information now because I had to take time to go get it. Much like we just heard in our first talk about the speed of light and the, the weather we might get or the, the mail we might get via horseback across the country. I hope that's not mine. <laughs> this was our mode of travel. And it changed the way we view the world because the idea that that information could be had limited our ability to think that information mattered. I mean, if you don't know about it, how can it affect you? So in this time, ideas and information were limited. Our understanding of the broader world was limited until somebody had this fascinating idea. They could take little strips of metal, hang it on tree poles, and send signals down. Well, that came up with some interesting ideas. Because people, and here's a map of England in the 1850s, showing some of the, the early telegraph lines. And this guy had an interesting idea. Um, he had a little bit of experience with sailing, and I had an idea for why it might help sailors. If you remember the name, by the way, who know your history, he'd done some sailing aboard a ship called the HMS Beagle. Anybody heard of that? Guy named, uh, uh, guy, uh, <laughs> the guy that wrote uh, Origin of Species, Darwin. He was the captain for that ship. And when he came back, he convinced the British government to give him some money. He trained some guys and sent them off to the corners of England. Trained them to meet, read these newfangled machines called barometers and thermometers. And their job was to watch the weather, make measurements, and hoof it down to the nearest telegraph office every couple hours. And they'd send that information by telegraph to him in London. And he was gathering information from all over England. It's not so much that he was interested in having a better picnic on Sundays. It was more interested in sailing. And that time, thousands of ships were lost. Not sailors, ships were lost every year due to bad weather. They had no idea when going out to see whether the weather would be fair or foul tomorrow. But he did. He saved thousands of lives. And in fact, the predictions that he made were so new and so noteworthy, there wasn't even a word for it. So he created one, he called it a forecast. The word we, word we use today, he had to create. The change that this made, going back to our view of the farmer in the valley, was that the farmer could now look at a newspaper and see weather reports, not just for the next city, but in advance for what would happen several days ago, or in advance. 
This was shocking. The idea that you could know information a long ways away, and the idea that you could anticipate it and that it mattered to you was shocking. And this actually led to some other interesting changes because it was such a new idea that it actually grew and grew fast. This tiny little idea of sending copper wires across the country grew at a rapid clip. You may note this shape of this curve, or this curve about railroad growth. It starts off with a couple hundred miles. They had put up 200,000 miles of railroad lines in 50 years. These types of things start small, these little ideas, and they grow. And they grow surprisingly. So why do I start off talking about history on this fine morning? Because I wasn't talking about a farmer in the 1850s. I'm talking about us. We're so proud of what we've got. But we are just as ignorant, and our world is wrenching forward as rapidly as that man in the 1850s. Yet we cannot see it. It is starting off slowly, and it is growing fast, and it is very hard for us as humans to see this type of effect. It's now our turn to wonder. Because I point at this little device. Does anybody here have a smartphone? <laughs> because I, I ask that semi-humorously. Do you know when this device was invented? The first iPhone came out? No, 2007. The iPhone was, did not exist before 2007. That was 11 years ago. 11 years ago, none of you would have had a smartphone in your hand. Now every single one of you does. You expect information continuously, always, and at a fingertip. This is the wrenching change. There are 1.5 billion of these things sold a year, going from a product that did not exist 11 years ago. This is exponential change. Here's a plot. We'll talk about it more, another exponential curve. Um, what's kind of interesting is this point right here. Um, there's about 7 billion people on the planet. This is the point uh, about, five, about seven, eight years ago, where we crossed over having one device for every man, woman, and child on the planet. We now have two to three devices for every man, woman, and the child on the planet. Does this curve say we're done? Oh, no. This curve is the plot of the number of transistors on a computer chip. We'll talk about this a little bit more. You notice a sort of similar curve there? These things start small, but they grow very quickly. And what's so hard for us as humans to understand, I mean, our brains did really good at understanding whether there was a tiger around the corner that was going to eat us. But it's not very good at exponentials. See, if I ask you, how far will I go if I walk five steps? You'll nail that. Okay, I want you to double that. Okay, I'll probably be over there. Um, another three times that, I'll be over there. I got that. I'm good at linear. Now let me ask you about exponential. If I square my distance of steps, I'm not over there. I'm outside the room. If I square it again, I'm on the other side of the campus. These effects are hard to anticipate, and they make our ability to uh, forecast that very limited. And it has other impact, impacts as well. See. When you start off here, exponential curves are actually weaker. They're less impactful at the beginning, and they're very easy to ignore. Because they seem to be, well, it, it'll just go away. And the linear effects seem to dominate. The problem is that part. That's where things take off. And depending on who you are, you either view this as a disruptive kick in the stomach, or you view it as an opportunity. It's just a question of perspective. See, let me give you an example of a fairly well-to-do company. I know the people in the front row have never even probably heard of this. But for the people in the back, you remember these boxes that you carry around that had this plastic film, and you took pictures. They were cat bird seat in the cat bird seat in the mid-'90s. They rocked. They had a cash cow that was bringing in cash hand over fist. Then this guy had this idea, can I make a box that doesn't put it on plastic film, but 
actually brings it in, takes digital images. Well, it turns out the pieces of film have about you know, 10 to 50 billion pixels on them. He, he had 100,000 pixels. It's pretty insignificant. Remember I said the, the curve tends to be a little bit low in the beginning? He presented this to the board of Kodak, because he worked for Kodak. And the board laughed. And they said, you've got to be kidding. We're making money hand over fist. Don't distract us. That thing weighs 10 pounds. <laughs> they had the patents. They had the initial idea. They had the researchers. They knew color. They knew pixels. And they died. In the same year, these guys, 13 people, sold for a billion dollars. A recurring theme in this talk is the fact that what you used to need, you don't need now. Because the resources that we have for the young people here are so phenomenal that you don't need 100,000 people to change the world. And now we have all these. The technology that's racing forward now is mind-blowing. So what I, oh, part of what the point is, it used to take a billion dollars to be able to influence a billion people. Now you don't. You need a laptop, the internet, some free software, and coffee. Never underestimate the importance of coffee in great achievement. Now a kid in Mumbai can teach themselves code, can pull down the best neural net code, TensorFlow, for example. Google runs on TensorFlow. All the stuff we're going to talk about today is TensorFlow. It is free. Every line of code is open source and public. You can read every line. You can copy it down from anywhere on the planet and have access to all the resources that Google has. Wow. Would Kodak have done that? Oh, hell no. So now somebody in Mumbai can pull that down, get a laptop, and build a startup, and build great technology because they had the idea. The tools are available to every one of you. You just need the idea and the gumption to make it happen. You don't need the billion dollars. All the best code libraries are free. Read GitHub. And the classic line, I didn't know I couldn't do it. So I just did. And of course, the courses. We'll talk about that a little bit more. You don't need to go to a great university, no disrespect, <laughs> to figure out how to do this. All the information you need, and to a large extent, is available for free. And the venture investors are following. So we find ourselves here. Are we any different than that farmer? Trying to anticipate the changes that are pulling out from under our feet. Let's talk a little bit more about the technologies, uh, underpinnings that are changing all of us. There's a couple of technology revolutions that I think are really important that'll help you understand why this is happening now. First, silicon. Second, sensing. Third, the manufacturing revolution. And lastly, the algorithms. First off, silicon wafers. Now, this is cool to me. I did my doctoral work in designing um, computer chips. They're really cool. They're a lot of fun. They started off with one transistor back in the 1950s. It was big, it was ugly, but it worked. Here's a cross-section of your iPhone microprocessor. This is a couple years old, so it's kind of big. Um, the line you see right there, that's a two micron scale bar, which means the transistors are tiny. Human hair, if you were to pull one from your head, it's about 50 microns. So this is really tiny. This shows you how Moore's law which is not really a law, but it happens to fit really nicely. Um, obviously, it started with REN transistors somewhere down there, and it actually keeps going way up there. Has continued exponential growth, not about doubling of the number of transistors on a chip about every 18 months, every two years. It just keeps marching along until you have this picture. This is a cross-section of a transistor. There's a scale bar by there. It's no longer two microns. Five nanometers. Can anybody tell me what those dots are? Atoms. Atoms. We're now making transistors that have a countable number of silicon atoms in them. This is a 10 nanometer device. So you silicon is about a half a nanometer um, uh, lattice distance. 
So you have about 20 silicon atoms across in a transistor. And this, by the way, is old. This is a two-year-old image. They're now doing not 10 nanometer, but 8 nanometers going into production. We now are manufacturing devices with a countable number of atoms in every part. And it's not just you're making one of them. You got 10 billion of these, 20, 30 billion of these in every chip. And every chip on that wafer is working at 90, 95% yield capacity. This is phenomenal. And not just because of the side, the amount of energy needed to switch those atoms from one state to another is insignificant, which is why every generation of my smartphone works longer and does more. It takes less energy to make each switch. And it takes us back to this, of why it's marching along. The co computational capacity is driving this, which is why we have this exponential curve. Because it started off with this idea of I could have an Apple II Plus or an IBM PC. It ended up with a smartphone that I hold in my hand with all the resources of a crazed supercomputer from a decade or two ago. And we don't even think about it. What do we use it for? It's not computing the weather. I use it for Facebook. I send text messages and watch videos of cats. <laughs> the next revolution is the cloud revolution. Because it's not just that I can put 50 billion transistors into my hand. I can, I can spin up 10,000 of those boxes with a moment's notice. I have an app on my phone there. We use Amazon Web Services for our company. I have an app there. I could spin up 10 instances of um, high-end computing resources by touching a button on an app on my phone. Within two to three minutes, those resources will be online and doing whatever I want. I pay um, maybe a penny an hour. If I want something really powerful, I'll pay 50 cents an hour. I don't have to build a room or air conditioning, wait six weeks for Dell to show up the boxes, install software. I just press a button and I have the best computing resources on the planet for my hour. And when I'm done, I shut them off. I don't have them sitting around. Somebody else can use them. I don't care. As a startup, as someone with a cool technology idea, I have access to thousands of servers instantly, and I'm done. No cost. I'm counting in pennies. Next revolution is sensing. Sensing doesn't sound very exciting because we do it so effortlessly. We all have our senses. I'm sensing the room and watching all of you. I'm feeling the air. I'm hearing my voice. I'm speaking. We do it all the time. We don't think much about it. But truthfully, most computers sit in warehouses like this. They don't have much to sense. Historically, we've just run accounting numbers and videos through them. They don't do a whole lot of sensing of the world. But that's changing. Part of what we're doing now is we're carrying around the sensors for them. Do you realize that that smartphone you're carrying has 25 sensors on it? And you and everyone else on the planet are scurrying all over the planet, carrying those sensors everywhere? It's almost like this roving hive of ants with sensors marching all over for those computers. They're literally sensing the world through you. And it's not just you, it's your cars. They've got 150 sensors on them, 200, 300. See, what's happening is the amount of devices, and IoT is this, Internet of Things is this really cool topic right now. But IoT is really just another word for a little sensor that's connected to a network. Whether it's the Nest thermostat in your house that's measuring the temperature, or it's the phone that you're holding that's measuring the light and the, uh, your location, these devices are growing. We've already said we're at the point where we're at two, uh, two to three devices for every man, woman, and child on the planet now. We're going to eight and 10 devices. I'm gonna ask you an interesting question. I've got two hands, I've got one phone. If there's going to be 10 of these devices for just me, where are they going? Very good. She says accessories. Yes. They're going in surprising places. And I want to spend a few minutes, because we get all excited about the better, faster computer and the screen. But that's actually not where the real innovation is happening. And I want to give you a flavor for that. I'm going to start here. A doorknob? Really? Come on, we didn't show up this lecture to talk about doorknobs. Well, maybe we did. 
It's worked very well as technology goes for the past couple hundred years. But I stayed in a hotel this morning that had a key card and I swiped my electronic key card to get in. Why doesn't the door in my house work the same way? You know it will. You have a smartphone. The door recognizes the Bluetooth signature when I walk in and says, um, welcome home, Kevin. Your wife's home, son's home, your daughter just left. You don't think that's going to happen? Every doorknob in the country soon will. Or better yet, little plastic buckets. Seriously? I'm talking about trash cans? Well, some interesting things happened. When they started putting sensors in trash cans, turns out, as quoted here, they reduced the number of cl garbage collecting shifts from 17 down to 3. Turns out most of the garbage they were collecting was empty. And if they measured the garbage level in each trash can, they didn't have to measure them as often pick them up as often, and the ones that were already full early, they got them early, and they saved 15 trips every week. They saved a million dollars in terms of gas, truck rolls, smog, carbon footprint, and employees. Remember, these are just little plastic buckets, but we put some sensors on them and a little connectivity, and suddenly we dramatically change carbon footprint and the need for services. Or what about your house? As ignominious as it is, it's a pile of sticks, stucco, a little concrete, and maybe some paint. Dumb, dead, and simple. Until you add Alexa. But think about it for a moment. You've just brought this massively intelligent uh, conversational resource into your house. And not just one of them. I've got three of them in my house. Well, until yesterday, the cats knocked one of them into the water bowl, and I found Alexa floating in the water bowl. Um, I'm still hoping it'll dry out. But we watched Jean-Luc Picard in uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, and we'd say, tea, Earl Grey, hot. Well, we don't have the food synthesizers down. But your ability to just call out, hey, Alexa, play some Caravan Palace. I can ask it anything. It's a kind, I have made my house intelligent. My house becomes conversational. And just with a $29 hockey puck. Same thing goes with delivery services. It's no longer a question of just sending out a delivery service uh, uh, van. The top of the van includes a quadricopter. The driver hops out, delivers a package to you. The quadricopter hops out and delivers across the street. You now play leapfrog back and forth down the street. You've doubled your productivity. With any extra trucks, any extra any truck rolls or carbon footprint? No. Or doctors. This is having a huge effect, and this is the field that I'm working in right now. Take, for example, the question for heartbeat. You go in and you spend your three to four minutes with the doctor, and the doctor says your heart's fine. But he has an idea there's a problem. You have a million heartbeats every week. You can have a cardio cardiologist look at all those? No. You are a small device measures all the heartbeats for the past week. Machine learning looks at them and says, there, there, and there. We saw five events. Those events then get handed off to the cardiologist, who then makes the determination that there's a problem. But you've now reduced 196 hours worth of heart information into a quick summary. This changes your ability to look for spurious and unusual events. Or utility meters. No longer do you have to send truck rolls out now all that information has gotten wirelessly. Or light bulbs. This is actually a really fun one. Talk about a 100-year-old piece of really mature technology. What could you do for this? Well, when you get rid of the thermal incandescent bulb and change it to LED, LEDs work on 5 volts. I don't have to run 120-volt cable to it anymore. I can run a fairly thin cable to it. Um, does anything run on 5 volts like a Ethernet? Oh, yeah. I can put 60 watts down an Ethernet cable. In fact, all of the wireless networks, all of your data networks on this campus all run on Ethernet. Every light bulb suddenly becomes a sensor endpoint, measuring occupancy, temperature, humidity, ambient light. So when the sunlight streams in, the lights dim. When the sunlight goes down behind a cloud, the lights come back up. So now your light bulbs this is called the Trojan horse of the commercial industrial world, when every light bulb becomes 
a sensor endpoint. It doesn't have to just be sensing. Turns out these things, when they're LEDs, you can switch them pretty fast. What's fiber optics work on? LEDs. It's lasers, but very similar. Now every light bulb actually can emit data encoded on the light. We can only see up to 30 hertz. So you switch the signals at megahertz. You don't actually see it, but your phone does. Now every light bulb actually becomes a wireless transmission. It's called Li-Fi instead of Wi-Fi, a wireless transmission mechanism. So suddenly light bulbs actually become data transmission. Cars, is this even worth me mentioning? We all know what's going on there with autonomous vehicles. There's sensor endpoints as well. Farming. Doesn't seem very exciting, but now every field is measuring hydration at two foot, four foot, and six foot down, as well as salinity, because of salinity encroachment, salt comes up from the groundwater. Um, uh, pest encroachment, amount of sunlight, amount of uh, herbicide, and amount of insecticide. Fields become instrumented. So, back to my question. I've only got one hand, I'm gonna have one smartphone. Where's the other 50 billion coming from? In fact, the challenge before us is not just to look at uh, doorknobs and trash cans, but for you to look at the things, and I actually point to all of you, look at the items around you and ask, how would it be different? We all grew up with light bulbs and uh, doorknobs always just being light bulbs and doorknobs. But who can look at a trash can? Who can look at a car, a plant, a hanger, or a chair and visualize how that would be different? I can't. I'm too inured to having grown up with it. You can look at it different and have an entire new industry follow after you. Let me read this quote because I think it makes that point so well. This is Mark Weiser, who is CTO of Xerox Park. This is the opening lines of his uh, Scientific American article in the 1990s. Uh, I was a visionary. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it. All those devices will disappear. If they've done their job right, you won't even notice that little power outlet there. It's everywhere and power is free. You don't know water. You can get water for free. You get salt for free. All these devices will soon just disappear into our lives. I next want to talk about the manufacturing revolution. Doesn't sound exciting in the slightest, I'm sure. But the point is this, all those silicon wafers we talked about are actually made on silicon. Silicon's fairly expensive. They've now developed techniques that allow you to do the same things, not quite the same resolution, but pretty close on paper and plastic. I now can make my devices on roll-to-roll -roll printing. I can, instead of having to use fancy electronics wafer fabs, they're now building these devices roll-to-roll -roll, hundreds of yards at a time. You can actually print LEDs, photo detectors, on these. So we now have product packaging that has images and video that move on them. Can you imagine boxing, uh, boxes, um, packaging, or Coke cans? This is one of my favorite. Coke cans, that, Coke cups that identify when there's a liquid in it, and the images on the side now start doing a happy dance because they have something in it while you're drinking it. This changes the way packaging is done, the way signage is done, the way the world around us does. It's no longer just cars with static paint on them. It's cars with moving images on them. This is happening right now, and it's changing the way things are done. Which leads me to the fun part. If we have all this information in ones and zeros coming off all these devices in every different direction, it's really just numbers. I mentioned the heartbeats. Who's going to look at a million heartbeats? Well, now we have 50 billion of these devices. I'm not looking at all the data. I'll be clear about that. Our problem now is we've come up, had to come up with new words. We now have to talk about yada bytes and bronto bytes worth of data. How are we going to handle this? And this is where machine learning comes in. Machine learning is based on a simple concept the idea of something called a neural net. The idea that the neurons in your brain can be modeled 
fairly effectively. And you can have vicious uh, religious arguments over uh, whether or not this matches a neuron or not. It really doesn't matter. Fact is, this happens to look similar to it, and its power is phenomenal. Because that little neuron there, artificial neuron, may look very simple until I stack them together. Just like a single neuron in your brain doesn't do much, but you put a billion of them together all connected, well, suddenly we can write poetry. Poetry? Well, interesting things happen. And I do want to compare against one thing, traditional coding. For the past 50 years, we've been pretty good coming up with if-then statements. If this, then that, else do that. And there's a nice little bit of a Python code there. It's worked really well for us, but we've tried for 50 years to come up with a way to translate machines, uh, human language. You can do that. You can say, this is a noun, this is a verb, and you put them together and you get this type of a sentence. It's failed. Failed miserably. Until they started doing things like this. This is an example of how you code a neural network. In this case, they took a neural network, a blank, uh, unwritten uh, tabula rasa, a blank sheet, and they introduced it to Tolstoy, character by character, 100 times. And what you can see is pretty pathetic. But you can model this on a human. What does a one-year-old child do, having heard the mother's and father's language for a year? You get gobbledygook. And you're pretty proud of it. You love hearing them say, mom, or ga, or ook. But after 300 iterations, this neural network starts getting one and two letter words well, right. You may not find it very exciting, but it got on right. It got period, uh, quotation mark. Um, it got the period and followed by a capital letter. Capitalize the I. OK, yeah, yeah, you're saying, you're so excited about this. Yeah, I pity you. But after 500 iterations, it's spelling two and three letter words right. After 1,200 iterations, you're getting noun, verb, matching. You're getting uh, the um, paragraph mark, the quotation marks are properly matched. Uh, capitalization is right. Proper matching of quotation marks across long lengths of uh, text. Um, but I would be done and that's proper formation of English. No one told it this. We just gave it examples of Tolstoy over and over again. Does this start to look like humans at three-year-old, five-year-old, seven-year-old, until you get this one at 2,000 iterations? You actually start getting something in the style and tone of Tolstoy, which is pretty impressive because it takes humans a while to get that. What's really interesting is if you do this more and more, it actually starts to hallucinate, and that's the word that's used in the field, it actually starts to hallucinate proper Russian names. Makes up new ones. Makes up new grammatical scenarios that work perfectly. Now, obviously something's missing here. The higher level meta understanding, the sentences don't go anywhere. This doesn't make sense like a thousand pages of uh, high level uh, uh, plot line in Tolstoy. But the trend is clear. One, you can train something with just examples. That's how humans work. And two, you don't have to code this in the same way. This is why Google was so excited about getting all the voice information. Amazon is collecting voice information. They're, why did Google start off with Gmail? They wanted all those examples of all your emails to be able to get proper um, sentence structure. They didn't explain how English worked. They gave it a trillion emails and said, you figure it out. My point is this. The way we train machine learning systems is completely different than the way we coded before. And this is what a neural network looks like. It comes a bunch of inputs, and they all go, in this case, this one is connected to a whole bunch of previous layers. And whenever something lights up, it fires up in a message. And these things all cascade into this one, and these cascade into that, and to that. There's no machine, there's no soul here. It's just mathematics. But the mathematics is shockingly powerful. Here's part of my explanation of the change in the way we code, and this is kind of important. It used to say you take several hundred coders, you give them a little bit of data, put them away for a couple months, and say, come back when you figured out some code. Great. 
and you'd change your data, and they would come back and make changes and make the code bigger and bigger and bigger until it generally got unmanageable. Now you take one code or some Python and TensorFlow source code, you give it massive amounts of data, and you get a model when you're done. When you change the data, you just add more data. Coding teams are small, the data sets are large, and the results are phenomenal. We'll give you some examples of that later. All of this has come together to why now we have machine learning taking over the way it is. We've got cheap computational resources. We've got massive piles of computational resources. The algorithms have gotten where they are, and the amount of data we have is huge. Remember I talked about brontobytes? We thought that was a problem a few minutes ago. Now we're saying <laughs> that's not a problem, that's exactly what we want. Let me give you two examples. The game of Go, I'm not sure if anybody here has ever played the game. Um, it's kind of like chess. If you view chess as sort of a single battle, Go is an entire war taking place in an 18 by 19 board. It's a fairly old game, it's one of the oldest. In fact, I, I read an interesting quote where somebody said, the rules of Go are so simple that if we ever meet alien life, we'll probably find that they're playing a game similar. The rules are so simple, it's probably relatively universal. The board seems relatively small, it's just 19 by 19, but there's a lot of freedom in that board. Humans usually take 20 to 30 years to get good at it, but we actually do get pretty good. The problem is this, the very first move, I've got 361 possible moves, okay? Once I've moved that, I now have 360 possible moves, and then 359, and 358. And this multiplies up a little bit, not a little bit, a lot. Um, the number of possible moves is 10 to the 170th power. Um, there's only 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe. If every atom in the universe had a universe of atoms inside it, you still wouldn't match the number of moves that are available. Clearly, we can't play this game. Oh, we do. Humans somehow have an ability to process this game even though it's massively too complicated for our brains to play. What gives? Our brains seem to have an ability to handle very large uh, uh, spaces of information and still function surprisingly well. Computers, on the other hand, dead fail. You can't compute this. It's too deep, too rich, too long. You can go a couple of levels and you're toast. Humans don't seem to have a problem with that in the slightest. In fact, what was interesting is that, you know, as a human, I can look at this a fairly complicated board, I can look at this and just instantly have a pretty good idea where the next move should be. Computers can't. A couple of years ago, the greatest computer scientists were being asked, what do you think compu computers are ever gonna match and understand Go? They said, 10 years minimum. Even that, we're not sure if we'll get it. The next month, Google put their article out. They'd nailed it. The machine learning algorithms that I showed you for understanding Tolstoy were applied to the same idea here. They took 30 million moves from several hundred thousand human games and they fed it into this over and over and over until it had a pretty rich understanding of what was going on. They beat the rest, of, by the way, if you have Netflix, if anybody has Netflix, watch a show called AlphaGo, which is the name of this code. Beautifully done documentary that explains the process of going through this. They played against the best player in the world. They beat him four out of five games. What was really interesting is there was a move on game three where the computer made a move and everybody, all the experts in the room said, wow, that was wrong. That was so wrong. No human would ever play that. That was, he's lost the game. Uh-uh. It was almost an alien move. No one had ever seen it before, and it won the game. We're starting to see imagination coming out of some of these ideas, where we're seeing new solutions, and this is to our advantage. If we can get new innovation and new ideas out of some of these, we can actually take things further. I see AlphaGo not as a revolutionary breakthrough in itself, but rather as a leading edge of an extremely important development. The ability to build systems that can capture intuition and learn to recognize patterns. Here's my next one. This came out on Monday. 
I just put it in at 1 o'clock in the morning on this slide. Um, I don't think I have the ability. Does somebody else have it, or do I do this from the, the keyboard here? OK, I assume I do it here. I want someone to listen to this. I want you to listen to this and tell me if something's wrong. How can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Anything odd with that? Which one was human? <laughs> the caller in this case was a computer generated um, uh, and computer algorithm from Google called Google Duplex. This wasn't just a give me an appointment. Oh, okay, you got your appointment. This is an re appointment request with a problem. They wanted 12 o'clock, but it wasn't available. She was offered 12 to 2 or 1.15, but was able to think back, change the scenario, come back. Well, what I really want is 10 to 12. Sure, what's the service? Service? I had to understand service, understood that what that really meant was a haircut, and we just wanted a women's haircut. We also dropped in the, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. And the tone on it, it's a little off. I mean, I'm sure you all heard it. It's a little off, but it's damn close. This is something, and I was arguing with uh, Andra a little earlier about, um, the Turing test. The classic Turing test was you as a human could tell whether the person on the other side was a machine or a human or couldn't tell. We're starting to get to the point where we're passing the Turing test. This is machine learning being applied at a much deeper, richer level. It's not just playing a game. It's now starting to be able to handle simple, you know, three-year-old, five-year-old type problems. But the results are fascinating. Oops. There we go. So where is the opportunity? This is terrifying, is it not? We've got machines that are taking over what we used to think was our domain. At the very least, I should be able to take care of my own hair appointments. So we're, are we lost? I'm arguing that we are now in a world where we don't really know what's on the outside. And just as we laughed at that 1850 farmer, we're no better off. We're in a world where connections are exponentiating. Our ability to bring in information, I talked about the 1.5 billion cell phones all over the planet. Well, this connection is allowing us to reach out and communicate and use resources we never had available. For example, the other day, I needed to be able to render an image for a product placement for a product. I didn't have the software to do it. So I put it out on Upwork. I said, here's the CAD files. I need someone to render this. I had offers from all over the planet. I ultimately hired someone in the Ukraine. Cost me 100 bucks, gave me a couple of renderings within a couple hours. It was easy. We now have the connection and capability to use resources and to leverage resources from everywhere. Now, this means we're making use of the 5 billion phones, the 7 billion people, the 20 billion devices, the 5 to 10 million cell, cell towers. <laughs> 100 billion web clicks per day, lots of transistors, I'm gonna even try and say that, and our connections, which go on every day, all the time, forever. We're in a very different world. People are now starting to argue that we have just created almost an organism, a structure that wraps the world with connectivity, and we are almost computational nodes on this, a hive mind, if you will or we're wrapping the intelligent of the entire human race together in one large structure, connected structure. If we can find out a way to work, get along, 
it'll all work out fine. But the leverage and the resources that we have available here is changing the way we work and it's providing opportunity. Take for example music. There was a time when if you were an artist and you wanted to sell a song, you had to go through the record labels. If you wanted to buy music, you had to go to a record store. I know you guys have never heard of albums. You may have seen them in movies. Um, those of us who actually bought albums and CDs, um, they're little pieces of plastic that had music on them before you had phones. Music was released rarely, maybe once a year from your favorite artist, maybe every couple of years. Does that even compute now? When that happened, people said music industry would die. No one would make music anymore if it was going to be stolen. The music industry was clearly on the verge of death. Really? Where do you get your music from? I get mine from Spotify. I have access to seven billion, or sorry, several million songs. I just, t oh, that sounds interesting. I listen to that. It's instantly available. I get music from YouTube whenever I want it. I get music daily. I don't wait a year for a new artist. They put out their releases as they're editing them. Daily updates on songs as they're being created. Now you get songs from artists weekly. And this is supposed to be the death of the music industry? My point is this. What people thought was destroying the system of music turned out to be a revolution. The music industry is more vibrant and stronger and richer than ever. And yet a few minutes ago, we thought we heard a computer that was going to just, is this destroying our life when they take over some of our roles? No. This is opportunity for us. We have to have the mindset to see it. Jobs are changing. Skills are changing. Opportunity is changing. Let me jump here. I want to talk about a, a couple of factors here, and then we'll be done. Education. The old model was you went to great universities. Oh, sorry, I'm careful there. Um, I, I've played the game too. I've got five degrees, three masters, a PhD from the best universities. If you can play that card, do it. But you don't have to. And we need to be aware of that. For example, I was handed a resume from my co-founder and CEO for a coder. Looked it up, seemed you know, didn't have the strongest skills, but pretty good. I asked him some questions, he went, and I said, I want you to answer these questions for the interview. He did. He came back, he nailed them. I was like, really impressed. It's like, yeah, I want to hire you. When did you finish university? I haven't. I'm first, I'm uh, just starting my sophomore year in college. I'm like, really? It's like, you nailed this TensorFlow question. Well, yeah, I took the Coursera free course um, a little while ago. I went through the tutorials on the TensorFlow website. I taught myself Python, and um, did I do okay? Well, yeah. You didn't, he figured out he didn't have to wait till junior year of college to learn Python. He didn't have to wait till his senior year class to learn how, what machine learning was. He didn't know he had to wait. He just did it. So do you tell that kid in Mumbai that they have to go to an IIT, Indian Institute of Technology, in order to be able to do a great coding? No. All they need is a laptop, some free code off GitHub, and some free courses off Coursera. What is your limitation here? It's not. Get the great education. I'm all for that. But what I'm saying is the competition now is not limited. Whether it's in Rio de Janeiro, whether it's in Moscow, whether it's in uh, Shanghai, or in Alabama. They're not limited by needing a great university in order to compete. They just need gumption. And Stack Overflow, and <laughs> Stack Overflow, in case you haven't ever used it, it's phenomenal. Um, I needed to learn Python three years ago. I hadn't coded in Python before. Um, I went to Stack Overflow, I said, how do you add to an array? Someone showed me some sample code for it. I'm like, okay, I can do that. How do I sort an array? Sample code. How do I do this? Sample code. I went there after 20 or 30 times. I got the feeling for Python. Suddenly I taught myself and I could ask richer and more interest intelligent questions on Stack Overflow. I got all the answers. I didn't need a course. I didn't need a book. I had sample code and the Google search questions were so good they always found me the answer. Code development. This works for a lot of different industries right now. 
where you used to need cube farms filled with thousands of people. Oh, no, you don't. You need a good coffee shop, some friends, some free software, and the gumption to make stuff happen. Great startups. Where did all those apps start come from? Were they come from big companies? No, they came from somebody with a good idea. The code's free. The development platforms are better than anything that came from Microsoft or Apple. The free development platforms rock because they're made by people that use it day in and day out. Manufacturing. We've touched on this a little bit. You used to need a billion dollars to set up a manufacturing line. Not anymore. For $1,000, you can get yourself a good uh, 3D printer and start making new designs. The design software for it, any surprise? It's available for free off GitHub. New ideas. Remember I asked you, who's going to come up with the next great idea for I I IoT, Internet of Things? It's somebody like any of you looking at a device you've had all of your life saying, why doesn't this talk? I can't look at it because I've spent 50 years staring at it and they say, of course it doesn't talk. It's a lump of metal. You're looking at it and say, oh, that'd be cool. And the bigger idea is the Internet of Ideas. The number of people that now can provide those ideas, it's not just the highly paid engineers at IBM who are doing product ideas. It's all of us. And lastly, machine learning. I've said this over and over again. The resources for all the stuff you need is free now. You just need to, uh, the, the gumption to go and get the courses and figure out how to do it. The opportunities go to those who want to learn, those who want to build, those with who need a fast computer, and coffee. Don't forget the coffee. Um, and startups. So here we are. We started off laughing at this poor old farmer from the 1850s who just didn't really know much. We're not much different. We are just as, we have a tidal wave coming at us just like he did. I don't know where it's going. But I can tell you if you're open-minded, there is more opportunity than ever. Are the jobs changing? Yes. 20 years ago, webmaster didn't even exist as a job. Hundreds of thousands of people have that job now. When uh, assistants and secretaries go away because they're taken over by uh, AIs, okay, those jobs disappear. But the new ones come into play. I don't even know what they are. 20 years from now, the job you have, I don't even know exists now. But I can tell you in 20 years, there will be places, there will be new work that needs to be done. We just don't have the name for it yet. And I'm hoping that you guys are the ones that actually create those new jobs. So where is technology going? I don't know, but we're at the front of a tidal wave. All right. Um, oh, some people ask what books I like to read, uh, where some of the ideas I get uh, comes from. Uh, these are some fascinating ones. If anybody wants to know more about them, I'd be glad to tell you. And I thank you very much for your time. We'll take a couple of questions. Um, I begin. I'm old, so uh, that's where I'm coming from. Um, and I also spent all my life in Washington, D.C., so I have a focus there. A few weeks ago, there was a very uh, successful uh, computer person who I think was called before Congress and talked about all the information he amassed. I think it was something called Facebook. Yeah. And um, in, in essence, and I, and I overstate, there was some talk that said, don't you understand that Yes, you are technologically fantastic, but that there are human elements that you seem to be missing. And I would at least say, and I, I'm just asking for your comment, this young man or young woman in Mumbai who learns computer code, lots of us think that there would be some value if they learned more about humanity than merely ones and zeros. And I understand you're talking about mm -hmm. technology, but I do think that's something to, I, I ask for your comments on that. I think a grounding, I mean, my, my undergraduate minor was in humanities, and I 
loved it. The stories, I think, uh, invigorate us. Um, India, for example, has some of the richest, oldest stories in the, the history of civilization. Um, and I think in that particular culture, I think they are, uh, there is a deep understanding of the importance of narrative and history and epic. Um, obviously, we cannot lose that. Uh, and the machines will never displace that. The networks and the uh, machine learning that we have right now, one of the things I didn't touch on is necessarily backwards looking. If we're training it on existing data, that data is already old. That's not new. So training its ability to actually anticipate and imagine going forward, what well, we did a little bit with the Tolstoy example, but it's still relatively, well, let's say completely, um, infantile and naive. Um, computers don't write stories yet, and it's going to be a long time before they do. Humans are still going to be the story writers. Um, now, 20 to 30 years from now, I don't know. But I absolutely believe we all have to have a, um, a rooting, a background, a foundation in our own history, or we lose something. Um, so earlier you talked about new packaging and things like that coming into play, but they use a lot of plastic and, and chemicals and things like that. And these things that you were speaking about seem fun, but they seem extremely trivial. And how is this environmentally sustainable for us living well, on this planet? I think Can you speak on that? I, 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 unquestionably, I think it's a, we, you know, I think you can argue for a cataclysm in terms of um, uh, st stability. Um, I, I can't address that because the, uh, the industries and the executives that drive that packaging is something that I don't have the influence to change. Um, I'm merely identifying trends and opportunities of things that will likely happen. I can't argue for whether they're sustainable or ethically good. Um, and that, I think, is an opportunity for young people such as yourselves to change, uh, to be able to go in there and say, I, this isn't the way we want our world to work. It's interesting to see a lot of reusability, a lot of people are, what is it, straws. <laughs> this is a humorous one. Why did it take 20 years for us to figure out that straws are probably not a good idea because they're not recyclable? Well, okay, What's, how, how many more decades will it be before we start figuring out a few other things aren't really necessary? Um, so I, I look at that as young people needing to change that world. I'm just trying to identify the trends that I see coming. I will get to you. Uh, yes, sir. Again, coming from um, uh, the older people's perspective a little bit. I love the split. We got the front two rows yeah. and we got the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The old guy's back here. Uh, the Internet of Things. Yes. It's, it's wonderful and it's beautiful. Everybody can get every piece of coding information in the world. How can I be secure in the knowledge that if I get one of those electronic uh, doorknobs that somebody else will not be able to find the software to copy that and open my door instead of me. I, I, we live in a world of risk and I do not disagree with that. Um, the older offline world is far simpler and in many ways safer. Um, but we also delude ourselves into that respect as well. I mean, I love having a door with a nice big deadbolt on it. But the wall next to it's made of stucco and a gypsum board. And a good shoulder will go right through that with relatively limited effort. But I'm very proud of my door. Um, now, I don't want to change your point because electronics allow someone in you know, wherever, Rio de Janeiro or um, Florida or whatever, to reach through the network and access your door. Um, yes, uh, I don't disagree with that point. It's a different type of crime. Um, but someone still has to walk through the door uh, to, in order to make use of it. Um, security is an ongoing problem. Um, it turns out that humans aren't all that good at building secure systems. Um, some of the interesting work that's been done are actually on uh, uh, adversarial networks um, with machine learning, where you build a machine uh, learning uh, tool that says, um, your job is to come up with a secure method of, for this network. And then you take up another AI whose job it is to attack that network. Um, and you just let them run for a while. Um, and they've come up with some uh, shockingly good new 
security mechanisms that the humans hadn't come up with yet. I, I think my point on that one is we like to view ourselves as the only intelligence on the planet. And this may be upsetting to people. Um, I think we need to rightly understand that there are other intelligence other than human. And that doesn't mean they're good or bad, but they're different. Um, and I think if we recognize that there's other answers to problems, whether they come from a human or an alien intelligence, I don't really care. What I do care about is finding better solutions towards your security problem. I don't think it has to be written by a human to make it secure. Even if we need to use AIs and adversarial networks to come up with the strongest solution that does protect your door, then I'm all for it. Um, but in answer to your question, I just want to be flat out, security is a major issue. Humans have not worked that one out yet. Yes. He's got Hi. Try. Oh. I'm right here. <laughs> um, okay, yes. So what are your thoughts on the, basically kind of the controversial side of AI intelligence? Um, so the, mainly the people who make the algorithm for AI are white males mm -hmm. and it's been seen with deep learning because nobody understands what happens during the deep learning and the hidden networks yep. between the input and output, mm -hmm. um, that it has been proven that the AI intelligence, it's a lot easier for it to recognize a white male face than mm -hmm. any other demographic. And police um, have actually used AI for predictive policing, and it has profiled more lower income air areas and areas with more minority populations, and how it's kind of become, like, because it can only use the information that it has, and because it's planned, or it's made by a certain demographic, like how are, to combat that with AI intelligence to move on so we don't get stuck, like, going two steps back socially. You have brought up a very important point, um, and it has to do with bias in terms of how you train these systems. Um, I, just, I just want to say, like, ma'am, we have uh, two people up here that have been, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so it has to do with bias and how we train it. Let me give you an example. Take a young child and bring them up in a small uh, neighborhood with only white people. That person will only identify people as being white, as being comfortable. That is a limited data set for that neural network inside that child. That is their world and that is their biased world. We then take them to the neighborhood across the town where people have a different ethnicity. They're going to look at that as surprising and have difficulty in that world. The same thing happens with machine learning. It is absolutely true that most of the people that are building these data sets happen to be white, they happen to be male, and they're pulling data that happens to be easily available. I completely agree with that, and it is a serious problem because we have networks that are just like that small child brought up in, in what's it, isolated environments. I don't know how you answer that other than to be aware of your bias and to make sure that you have a balanced representation across uh, uh, data sets. I think that's true of humans as well, though. Um, for children that grow up in an isolated neighborhood, they don't have a representation across the world. That's why we have universities. We bring people together from all over so they are exposed to different cultures. We have basically found that we have a same problem with machine learning because they're isolated as well. I don't have a good answer other than that I think people in the world are becoming more aware of it. With regard to the policing issues, um, I think the answer there is any technology is a double-edged sword. Um, knives can be used to cut up peaches. They can also be used to hurt humans. Um, you have tools that can be used for good and bad. I think it's up to us to have a set of ethics that surrounds how these tools should be used. I don't agree with how the police are being used uh, in this scenario. I've read some of those articles as well, and I cringe. Um, I think there you have to train people to say, I don't think that's a good idea. They, we as a culture have to make those decisions. Have I answered your question? I don't, there's no easy answer to that one. Um, but I think being aware of it um, helps us start to defend against it. Okay, thank you. If that's okay, since the, the students get to meet with the speakers this okay. afternoon, we're all that for, the, for this afternoon, if that's okay with you, because to stay on schedule, uh, we're going to have to stop we'll here. Sure thank you, you very much. Come up.